Good morning, church. It is the second week of Advent. Advent is this discipline that we engage in every year that helps us learn to people be a people of longing and anticipation as we live in between the first coming of Christ, the promise of the fullness of the kingdom coming, and then the culmination of the kingdom at his second coming. We want to learn to be a people that faithfully anticipates what God is doing in the world and joining him in doing that. That is what Advent is about. And so our text, this second week of Advent, comes from the Old Testament, as Advent texts often do, because this is ultimately a telling of the story of Jesus' life, and we are telling that part of the story before he comes. The Israelites, like we are to do, were waiting for God to keep his promises, living in between the promise of the Messiah and the coming of the Messiah. So Isaiah 64 is our text for this week. Let me just read it real quick. If you only would tear open the heavens and come down, mountains would quake before you like fire, igniting brushwood or making water boil. If you would make your name known to your enemies, the nations would tremble in your presence. When you accomplished wonders beyond all our expectations, when you came down, mountains quaked before you. From ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God but you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You look after those who gladly do right. They will praise you for your ways. But you were angry when we sinned. You hid yourself when we did wrong. We have all become like the unclean. All our righteous deeds are like dirty rags. All of us wither like a leaf. Our sins like the wind carry us away. No one calls on your name. No one bothers to hold on to you. For you have hidden yourself from us. And we have handed us over and have handed us over to our sin. But now, Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. All of us are the work of your hand. So don't rage so fiercely, Lord. Don't hold our sins against us forever. But gaze now on your people, all of us. In this text which is uh, admittedly, self-evidently, on the face about waiting for God in the midst of the darkness. There are two things that we want to pay attention to for just a few minutes this morning. Two things that are important for us in this season of Advent. And the first is, um, when you read this text in the broader context of what Isaiah is doing, you notice certain dynamics coming out and playing that seem very familiar to our age, and I would argue are actually very familiar to the way just the world works in general. In the broader context of what Isaiah is doing, Isaiah 64 comes in the midst of this cycle of um, great visions of future hope and glory and great moments of lament. And so, for instance, you go back to Isaiah chapter 61, or even the end of chapter 60, but really picking up steam in 61. This is that text that Jesus loves so much that he quotes from in Luke chapter 4 in the temple, in that, or the synagogue rather, in Nazareth. This is the text that seems to be at play uh, behind the Beatitudes. Uh, this is where he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim the, the good news to preach it to the poor, the healing of sight to, blind, to the blind, the setting captives free, to proclaim the, the favorable year of the Lord. And so Isaiah 61, in the flow of the prophet's um, work, is this great mountaintop, right? Where he looks forward to the day, he's telling stories about the day when God will come and do what he has promised to do. God will make things right. Righteousness will overtake unrighteousness. Justice will overcome injustice. Light will break in on darkness. Healing will overcome the hurt and brokenness of our world. Peace will overtake violence. Joy will erase grieving. The list goes on and on and on. So you have texts like Isaiah 61 running through this section of Isaiah, but then they are also followed up and interwoven with, there's a cycle of up and down, peaks and valleys of the harsh reality that Isaiah either saw in the future or those that were his readers they, they lived in. This was a reality where Israel was a small nation. Israel was a vulnerable nation, and Israel was at the mercy of powers larger than them. 
Uh, scholars debate often whether or not Isaiah actually wrote these last chapters or whether it was someone who came after him. Either he was pointing ahead, embodying a future position, or somebody came in the school or the inspiration of Isaiah and wrote something later. But either way you want to do that, what Isaiah 61 through 66 is talking about is a time far in the future for Isaiah when they have gone through the exile where they have come out the other side of the exile, where they have returned home to their land only to discover that they are still captives in their land. And of course, after Isaiah's lifetime, the Babylonians came and they took Israel and Judah and they took everybody off into captivity. They destroyed the temple. They destroyed Jerusalem in many ways. Everything that the Jews held near was taken away from them. Of course, the big thing there, um, Ezekiel would say, is that God has left Jerusalem. His presence left the temple and went over the mountain. Now they have come back from Babylonian captivity, but the Babylonians, or rather at that time, the Persians still control things. And after the Persians, the Greeks controlled things. And the Greek broke, Greeks broke down into a variety of empires and they passed from Syrian control into Egyptian control. And then, of course, by the time of Jesus, the Romans controlled things. So even though their exile in one sense had ended. Even though they had in one sense returned home, they still lived in the midst of this darkness. And Isaiah is speaking to that time, looking forward to that situation where there is great hope because God is making these promises of all of these things that he will do, of setting things right, of making the world into what it was supposed to be instead of what it is. But even as they look forward to those times, they still live in the midst of that darkness where they're prisoners in their own land, where they're in their own homes, but their own homes are not really theirs, where they're at the mercy of others in the situation that they have brought about because of their sinfulness. And so Isaiah 64 comes out of one of those valleys, one of those lows at the end of Isaiah 63. And he asks the question, why don't you just rip the skies open? I love the imagery he uses there. Lord, if you would only just rip the skies open and descend into this realm where we can see and taste and touch and smell and hear and take care of your enemies, what a great thing it would be. And God, we know you can do this. We've seen you do it before. He hearkens back to those great moments of deliverance in times past. Perhaps the Exodus is in view where God entered into the darkness, responding to the cry of those who were being oppressed in that darkness and bringing liberation to them. God, will you not act this way again? And in many ways, Isaiah 64 is a natural um, continuation of what we were talking about last week. Last week, you'll recollect, we were in Job chapter 17, and Job is this unrelentingly dark text where he cries out at the end, where is my hope? Who has seen my hope? But the text cannot give us an answer about his hope. And we talked about how sometimes in our broken world, Advent teaches us through texts like this, these texts like Job 17 give us permission to simply acknowledge the brokenness of the world. Simply say things are bad. Things are not the way they're supposed to be. This is a less than ideal situation. And we don't have to rush in with easy answers or tired sentiments or say this too shall pass or don't worry God has a plan. Sometimes when people are in the midst of the darkest parts of their life, we can just kind of sit with them. Embody the presence of God with them there in the darkness. But one of the things that the darkness teaches us as we sit in it is it teaches us to long and to anticipate something more. It creates in us this sense that there's got to be something more to the world than this. Surely it's not supposed to be like this. Surely this isn't all there is. And so we begin to wonder. We begin to develop an imagination if we will let the darkness work on us in this way. And in this sense, the darkness is still a sign of the presence of God. We let the darkness begin to work on us in this way. What would it be like if the world isn't like it is? And that's just the way the world works. But what would it be like if the world is as it should be? 
Because that's what Isaiah is calling for in Isaiah chapter 64. In the darkness that Isaiah's folk were so familiar with, in the darkness that Job was so familiar with, what they learned to do out of the darkness, acknowledging the darkness, which is one of the great Christian moves. We acknowledge that the world is broken. We acknowledge that there are scary things. We acknowledge that things aren't the way they're supposed to be. We then learn to say, but there could be, but there should be more. And so Isaiah cries out to the Lord, Lord, if you would just tear the heavens open, you could come down and you could make things right. And so in acknowledging the darkness, we learn to cry out in the darkness. And, and see, that's um, probably the lesson here for us, that in the midst of the brokenness of the world, we do not acquiesce to it. We do not just kind of bow down and say, well, that's the way things are, but our response is to cry out. Because we know that God is the one who hears the cry of those in the darkness. And he answers that cry. This is in the book of Exodus we've been talking about on Wednesdays, what it means for God to say that he is the I am, that he is the Lord, that he is Yahweh. And so we learn to cry out against it. And it's interesting that uh, the New Testament, Jesus particularly, gives us a couple of tools here that are really handy to have around. Both of these tools, by the way, fall within the Lord's Prayer. The first is that line near the front, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That is, that at the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, whenever we say that, and I hope that you're saying it seriously and reflectively on a regular basis, we invoke the holiness of God. The holiness of God is not some esoteric, mysterious sort of thing, but the holiness of God is a way of talking about how God is different. And one of the primary ways that we talk about God being different is how he is different from all of the other gods in the world. He is the God over the way things should be, not the way things are. So we ask God when we pray the Lord's Prayer, seriously and reflectively, to come into the world and to act as the God who is bringing about things as they should be. Oftentimes when I'm praying the Lord's Prayer and I take time to reflect on that line, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I take time to ask God to demonstrate his holiness, to embody his holiness, to let his holiness loose in the world as he has done in the past, as he did in the Exodus, bringing his children out of slavery, bringing them to freedom and liberation and a better way of life. As he did in Jesus, that was a demonstration of God's holiness. His name was hallowed in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. God, as you acted in Egypt, God, as you acted on Calvary, act in our world today because it is a broken place. And we need more. We long for more. And then second, you might take pause at that line just after that. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Just take five minutes one day. And you and God in the midst of the prayer take time to ponder exactly what it would look like for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. How would life change for you? How would life change for your poorest of neighbors? How would life change for your most vulnerable neighbors? How would life change for those who have found themselves in holes too deep to climb out of? On and on this list could go. What would it look like? Just try to imagine what it would be like to have a world where God's will was done on earth as it was in heaven. Because that's what God is going for. And that is the longing and that is the anticipation, and that is the imagination that we want to develop. And so we join with Isaiah in the midst of the darkness, not just giving into the darkness, not giving up as people who have no hope, but saying rather, God, why don't you just tear the skies open? Why don't you just come down and make things right? Because in Christ, that is what God is doing. And um, I've only got about five minutes left, but let me add another point in here just real quick for you to consider. 
And that is that in developing this longing, there's a second thing that comes along with it that Isaiah 64 points out well. As we develop this longing, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something different. There's got to be something better. There's got to be a, a way the world ought to be, and amidst all of this, the way the world is. Um, sometimes, oftentimes, perhaps all the time, we will discover in the midst of that brokenness that we are a part of it. Certainly that was the case in Isaiah 64 as Isaiah was reflecting on the life of his people. God, we wish that you would come make things right, but we recognize that as we cry for the end of the brokenness that we are a part of the brokenness. We are a part of what is wrong with the world. So Lord, have mercy on us. That is to say that as we learn to develop this anticipation and, and this long, it is always a call for humility. It is always a call for repentance. It is always a call to lay down those things in our lives that pull us farther away from God and to go closer to God. It might be our political or our economic allegiances. It might be our religious traditions. It might be some personal struggle. It might be some beef that you have with your neighbor. It might be... Um, any number of things if we want it to get into particulars, but then we'll go from preaching to meddling. We don't want to do that. Uh, you know you. But as we call for God to bring his will on earth as it is in heaven, it comes with the obligation to live God's will in our lives as it is in heaven. And so there is in this a call to repentance, something that I think the church does not talk enough about. We are good at asking people who are coming into Christ for the first time to repent, repent and be baptized, but we don't give heed enough to the fact that sometimes we, oftentimes we, all the time, we are a continuing part of the problem in need of humble repentance. Advent is a season of for developing eyes and ears and a heart to see the brokenness of the world both at large and in us and asking the Lord to come into our lives and address that brokenness. And so church, I want to pray for you and then I'm going to ask you to pray with me and then we will uh, remember who we are. Let me check my time to make sure I've got time. Yeah, we're doing good today. Lord, help us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. In the midst of the brokenness, to know that there is more, that you are creating more. Help us to long for that, to anticipate that, to look forward to the day when you will rip the skies apart. You will descend and you will make things finally and fully and completely right. And Lord, give us hearts that respond to that in faithfulness and hope, casting aside whatever it is that keeps us from you. And we come and we pray to you today. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. We shall love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second commandment is like it. We shall love our neighbor as ourselves. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. We love because God first loved us. Anyone who says they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar. How are you going to love God whom you have never seen if you don't love your brother or sister who is right in front of you? So this is the command we have from him. Those who love God must also love their brother and sister. Church, we miss you. We are glad that we can keep one another and our neighbors safe, but we do miss you way over here. We can't wait to see you again. In the meantime, we love you. We're pulling for you. We're praying for you. Go be like Jesus. Have a great week.